around the world are celebrating the 150th birth anniversary of the father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, from 2nd October this year. On this occasion, the General Overseas Service of All India Radio presents readings from an autobiography or the story of my experiments with truth. The reading from the autobiography is presented by Sri Gopala Krishna Gandhi, writer, teacher, and the youngest grandson of Kasturba Gandhi and Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. The words of the Mahatma in the voice of his grandson. The Gandhis seem to have been originally grocers, but for three generations from my grandfather, they have been prime ministers in several Kathiawad states. Uttamchand Gandhi, alias Ota Gandhi, my grandfather, married a second time, having lost his first wife. He had four sons by his first wife and two by his second wife. I do not think that in my childhood I ever felt or knew that these sons of Ota Gandhi were not all of the same mother. Fifth of these six brothers was Karamchand Gandhi, alias Kaba Gandhi. Both these brothers were Prime Ministers in Porbandar, Tulsidas Gandhi and Karamchand Gandhi, one after the other. Kaba Gandhi was my father. He was for some time Prime Minister in Rajkot and then in Vankaner. Kaba Gandhi married four times in succession, having lost his wife each time by death. He had two daughters by his first and second marriages. His last wife, Putlibai, bore him a daughter and three sons, I being the youngest. My father was a lover of his clan, truthful, brave and generous, but short-tempered. But he was incorruptible and had earned a name for strict impartiality in his family as well as outside. My father never had any ambition to accumulate riches and left us very little property. My father had no education save that of experience. At best, he might be said to have read up to the fifth Gujarati standard. Of history and geography, he was innocent, but his rich experience of practical affairs stood him in good stead in the solution of the most intricate questions and in managing hundreds of men. The outstanding impression my mother has left on my memory is that of saintliness. She was deeply religious. She would not think of taking her meals without her daily prayers. Going to Haveli, the Vaishnava temple, was one of her daily duties. As far as my memory can go back, I do not remember her having ever missed the Chaturmas. Living on one meal a day during Chaturmas was a habit with her. Not content with that, she fasted every alternate day during one Chaturmas. During another Chaturmas, she vowed not to have food without seeing the sun. We children on those days would stand staring at the sky, waiting to announce the appearance of the sun to our mother. Everyone knows that at the height of the rainy season, the sun often does not condescend to show his face. And I remember days when, at his sudden appearance, we would rush and announce it to her. She would run out to see with her own eyes. But by that time, the fugitive sun would be gone, thus depriving her of her meal. That does not matter, she would say cheerfully. God did not want me to eat today. And then she would return to her round of duties. Of these parents, I was born at Porbandar, otherwise known as Sudamapuri, on the 2nd October 1869. I passed my childhood in Porbandar. I recollect having been put to school. It was with some difficulty that I got through the multiplication tables. To be at school at the stroke of the hour and to run back home as soon as the school closed, that was my daily habit. I literally ran back because I could not bear to talk to anybody. I was even afraid 
lest anyone should poke fun at me. There is an incident which occurred at the examination during my first year at the high school and which is worth recording. Mr. Giles, the educational inspector, had come on a visit of inspection. He had set us five words to write as a spelling exercise. One of the words was kettle. I had misspelled it. The teacher tried to prompt me with the point of his boot, but I would not be prompted. It was beyond me to see that he wanted me to copy the spelling from my neighbor's slate, for I had thought that the teacher was there to supervise us against copying. The result was that all the boys, except myself, were found to have spelt every word correctly. Only I had been stupid. As a rule, I had a distaste for any reading beyond my school books. But somehow, my eyes fell on a book purchased by my father. It was Shravana Pitra Bhakti Nataka, a play about Shravana's devotion to his parents. The agonized lament of the parents over Shravana's death is still fresh in my memory. The melting tune moved me deeply and I played it on a concertina which my father had purchased for me. Just about this time, I had secured my father's permission to see a play, Harish Chandra. I could never be tired of seeing it, but how often should I be permitted to go? The play haunted me and I must have acted Harish Chandra to myself times without number. Why should not all be truthful like Harish Chandra? was the question I asked myself day and night. My common sense tells me today that Harish Chandra could not have been an historical character. Still, both Harish Chandra and Shravana are living realities for me, and I am sure I should be moved as before if I were to read those plays again today. It is my painful duty to have to record here my marriage at the age of 13. I was told that two girls had been chosen for me and had died in turn, and therefore I infer that I was betrothed three times. Marriage among Hindus is no simple matter. Months are taken up over the preparations, in making clothes and ornaments and in preparing budgets for dinners. Each tries to outdo the other in the number and variety of courses to be prepared. Women, whether they have a voice or no, sing themselves hoarse, even get ill and disturb the peace of their neighbours. These in their turn quietly put up with all the turmoil and bustle, all the dirt and filth, representing the remains of the feasts, because they know that a time will come when they also will be behaving in the same manner. I do not think it meant to me anything more than the prospect of good clothes to wear, drum beating, marriage processions, rich dinners and a strange girl to play with. I can picture to myself, even today, how we sat on our wedding dais, how we performed the saptapadi, how we the newly wedded husband and wife put the sweet kasar into each other's mouth and how we began to live together. And oh, that first night, we were too nervous to face each other. We were certainly too shy. How was I to talk to her and what was I to say? The coaching which I had got would not carry me very far. But no coaching is really necessary in such matters. The impressions of the former birth are potent enough to make all coaching superfluous. We gradually began to know each other and to speak freely together. We were the same age, but I took no time in assuming the authority of a husband.